Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com, a proud affiliate of the Hockey News. I'm your host, Nick Berlansky, joined as always by Nick Horwat, and as we'll get to over the next 40 to 45 minutes, this might be a new low for the Pittsburgh Penguins. They fall 4-3 to three on Monday night to the Anaheim Ducks, losing now three of the four games in their season-long four-game homestand and five of their last six games overall. Horwat, we have plenty to discuss on that game last night, but I think the biggest storyline, hands down, is the goaltender. Tristan Jari has another rough night, making 23 saves on 27 shots all over the place in his crease. I texted you during the game, and I I said, it feels like we're watching the worst versions of Marc-Andre Fleury. He just has no idea where he's at and his own crease, and he's flailing all over the place. The worst part is, at least Fleury made some saves when he did that. Justin Jari allowed goals when he got you know, out of pocket and out of schedule, and it did not look good for Tristan Jari last night. It, you could say that he lost them, the Pittsburgh Penguins, that game. You could say that Eric Carlson lost the Pittsburgh Penguins that game, but that's what we're going to discuss here over the next couple of minutes. What did you think of Jari's performance, not just last night, but over the last two games, because he got pulled on Saturday night as well? Got pulled. Yeah, that's right. He got pulled. I forgot he got pulled until I was doing game recaps uh, because I was looking into the numbers. The, I mean, the Penguins put up 47, 42 shots last night. Let me pull that paper back out. 42 shots last night. Um, and just trying to figure that's like, you know, 40 something, 42, 42 last night, 40 something the other night um, against the Ottawa Senators. And yet Jari has not been making the saves, has not been in the zone we were at least i think the two of us were perfectly fine with the tristan jari contract heading into the season because who else free agent wise were you going to get because as we see and as one of them you know ended up signing a new deal the those goalies that were on the market are not on the market and as a matter of fact one of them the big one signed a nice long extension to stay where he said he didn't want to stay hmm conversation that should have been had months ago but we don't even need to have it anymore uh, but yeah just this isn't good from jari i think we all came into the season thinking yeah his skill is fine his skill is perfectly fine we know he can be a top goalie in the league the expectations are going to be high uh but i think we're yet to see that and when it comes to last night that was a struggle uh, that was a struggle especially considering he needed brian rust to bail him out for a couple of uh for that one chance there where he was just hot dogging out of the net. You know, luckily that was, he didn't get scored on in that one, but the first one he did. And I don't know what happened on that first one. The first, whenever I saw it live happen, I thought to myself, did he have to dive for that? Could he have just stayed in position? Uh, Looking at the replay, maybe he got caught on something. I don't know. I'm not also not a goalie coach or anything like that, but he just seemed like a wild man between, between his pipes. And it's not, it's not at all what you need from your starting goalie that you've put your faith into that has, he's proven it to proven that he could do it. He looked really good against Colorado. Um, Looked, if you want to take it back that far, looked really good against Washington, but every other game he's been in, it hasn't been there. And Chicago wasn't terrible either, Um, but the Penguins need saves. They need the timely saves and, Boy, oh boy, did they not get it last night, especially at the most timely of times in those closing seconds. Yeah, he's now allowed three or more goals in five of his seven starts to start the season. Not a good start for Tristan Jari on that brand new five-year contract with five-plus million dollars, a modified no-trade clause. A quick sidebar to bring up, based on what you said, is you know, you're not a goalie coach, so you can't really tell if you know, that would have been what the goalie coach would want him to do. Hey, just lay it all out there. I thought he could have pushed from left to right in that instance. I thought he had yeah. the time to do it. But that that brings up an interesting sidebar is, you know, we don't see in the NHL assistant coaches get made available. And I feel like, yes, you, you heard Mike Sullivan yesterday say, you know, about Tristan Jari playing deeper in his crease when he's not as confident in his game. He said that's something that you'd have to ask, you know, Andy Kyoto, our goaltender coach, about why don't they make them available? To, to the media, like Andy Kyoto is the goaltending coach. I'm sure a lot of people would like to ask Todd Reardon some questions 
pertaining to the power play. So it's just an interesting thing that, you know, the NFL does. And I know the NFL does a lot of things in a different way because of how big that sport is and how laser focused a lot of their fan base is. But I feel like a lot of the fans of the Pittsburgh Penguins and a lot of the media members would also appreciate getting to talk to some of these assistant coaches a little bit more often about things that they're specifically in charge of. The goaltending coach, talk about Tristan Jari's game. The the power play coach, talk about the power play that was 10% coming into this one. Mm-hmm. I just feel like that's that's something that never caught my attention until Sullivan's quote yesterday matched with what you said here today about, well, you know, I'm not a goaltender coach. And it's like, yeah, wouldn't it be nice to ask Andy Kyoto like, what's going on there? Like, why is he seemingly like a little bit more frazzled this year? Than he has been in recent recent years, so I, I don't know. I think that that would be interesting. That I, that really would be. I think I don't know how a lot of it works. I'm still only my second year at this <laughs> specifically, um, so I don't know how a bunch of it works. I think you have to like punch in requests for that sort of thing, like uh, yeah, even in a, uh, a press conference setting. I remember last year just randomly. We had Todd Reardon once. I think it was post game. I remember because Sullivan was unavailable. Was after, so Reardon came out. It was after a practice, from what I remember. Uh, but, oh, okay. Uh, just randomly, we had Todd Reardon once. Um, mm-hmm. I think Mike Sullivan is the other thing too. Is Mike Sullivan's usually really good about answering questions uh, that might not fully pertain to. Uh, him specifically i mean like we'll ask a bunch of power play questions we'll ask a bunch of goaltending questions and he's pretty good about answering because he is the head coach and does you know oversee and manage it all um but getting down to the nitty-gritty like the way he did say that's a question for andy kyoto you're right i think it would be and you're right the nfl does just handle things differently because i was thinking too like well the nfl does this but they are also much more of a I don't know, different, different monster when it comes to this sort of thing that yeah. they'll make their assistant coaches available. They'll make their, their officials available, which again, could really know. use that. No, the NHL won't though, because the NHL, no, the NFL play. doesn't make their officials av- available. I they don't they have to literally, they don't No, They don't have to account for their actions. They didn't just do it the other day with the no Steelers said, I could swear. I thought I saw a tweet. I'll look into it in a minute. Um, but uh, it w- the people would get made available, I think, because the NHL likes protecting their guys. Yeah, um, it's that's just the way it is, and maybe that's part of it. But also, like I said, Mike Sullivan's usually really good at it. Um, so maybe we also just haven't noticed because again, he is really mm-hmm. good. This is one of the first few. T- we'll, you'll get that's more of a question for Kyle or you no know, or uh, Hexy. You'll get that a lot. You know, yeah. him not knowing the GM situation. That's understandable. Yeah. Um, but he'll he's usually pretty good about knowing the coach's stuff. Yeah, yeah. He he knows what's going on with his team and he usually answers to the fullest, but it's just something different about talking to the guy that's specifically focused on just that. And he might have a different perspective. That's the only reason I mentioned that. But let's let's get back to, to Tristan Jari, the main topic of the, the, the main source of this topic here. What do they do with him at this point? Because, you know, he hasn't looked good through most of his starts. It's weird because the starts that he has looked good in, he's shut out the opponents, including the Colorado avalanche. So what do you do at this point? Because you just signed this guy, what, two months ago to a five-year contract with $5 million and he has a 12 team, no trade list. So what do you, what do you do at this point with Tristan Jari nine games into the season when it's already looking like this isn't good and he should be healthy. Like health shouldn't be a factor here. He shouldn't be dealing with that injury. He said that he was completely healthy going into camp. So unless he re-aggravated something, excuse me, it doesn't seem like it's a health issue. So what is the issue? We don't know, but what do you do if it pertains and persists where Tristan Jari plays at this poorly? Dude, I don't know. <laughs> Dude, I do not know. You hope Alex Nadelkovich can find a pot of gold. I... It's a lot of hope. Uh, it, it is a lot of hope. And here is the reason why they brought in Alex Nadelkovich. I, I mean, you hope that when he comes back, he's able to, to handle the starts 50 50 until Tristan Jari becomes the $5 million goaltender you're paying him to be. But if that day never comes this season, you're in a really bad situation because you're not going to want to buy out the remaining four years of that contract. That's going to cost you and handcuff you for a long time. So what do you do at that point? I, I mean, not to mention 
You know, the 12-team node trade list makes everything harder as well. You'll have 19 teams that you could potentially even look at. It's just a move that right now, prisoner of the moment, looks like it could be an anchor for the Pittsburgh Penguins if Tristan Jari does not turn it around significantly in the coming weeks. It's Yeah, it's going to be tough. Like, I genuinely don't know how to quantify anything that he's done so far. Like we said, two shutouts. Great. Other than that, he's giving up like five goals a game. Yeah. This is so far from ideal. Uh, and again, it's the timely goals too. It's the breakaway in the literal closing seconds. Your team is shorthanded. Maybe they should have capitalized on the five on three already. Sure. But man, you got to make that one. Or how about not losing your net? How about not losing your positioning? It, there's all kind of little things that are going to go into this. I do, and it, it, what doesn't make this any easier to talk about is that goaltending is voodoo, and we could come back from the California road trip going, Tristan Jari had a perfect road trip. He led in two goals the entire time just because that's the way goalies are. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's kind of really hard for me to come up with anything. And I know saying I don't know isn't a great answer, but truthfully, I don't know might be the only answer we have here because everything could change on the blink of an eye. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said though it doesn't feel like it right we're starting to get a lot of the feelings that we had last year i know you asked me before how does the feeling in the room it's starting to feel like it did last year all of a sudden yeah you know it's starting to feel like the 22 23 season is still here um there was a lot of early hope there was a lot of you know, early feeling out process with the new with the new faces that excuse is out the door come tomorrow because I think once November hits that whole, we have new guys. It's a feeling out process. Sullivan used the word, the words feeling out process. It may have been yesterday morning. Um, it may have been a couple of days ago. I don't remember exactly. But he said it yesterday is, talking about the power play with Riley Smith going out there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Sure, that is gone though. <laughs> what yeah. come tomorrow when it comes to new new faces in this lineup and a feeling out process? Gone. Your excuses is out of here because you've had all of training camp, preseason, most of preseason, considering you take guys in and out of the lineup, and then soon to be 10 games. This is where we should start to see what kind of team we have. And it's not pretty so far. We're still to, we're still yet to get a point from the bottom. From the bottom line, the third lines looked a hell of a lot better since Redeem Zahorna got here. Mm -hmm. You cannot fault the first line for any of this. Maybe their finishing ability is down a little bit. Cindy yeah. Crosby did have a career high 12 shots against the Anaheim Ducks. Mm -hmm. We'll leave that as it is. And Jake Gensel played 24 minutes last night. Yeah. I don't I don't know what to make of this team anymore. Welcome to the Ron Hextoff. Sorry, scratch that. Kyle Dubas era. Yeah, Here, here's the worst part I think about last night is all those guys that you mentioned played well. Yep. And I talked about this on the Iceberg Recap Show last night. All 18 skaters had good games. I couldn't find a single player that I looked at and I said his overall game was poor last night. They all had good games. Yes, yeah. did some of them make mistakes that they'd like to take back? I'm sure Eric Carlson would 100% say yes on that pass with about 20 seconds to go. And on the on the man advantage that sprung mason mctavish but mm -hmm. the one player that didn't perform and it seems like it's been like this for a couple of games this year is tristan jari mm -hmm. and that's scary because he's the one that holds the most weight in the conversation about whether or not you win or lose the game because on all four of those goals it was an opportunity for him to make the timely save to keep the momentum in the penguins favor and he just didn't do it and that's something that you can say well you know, he struggled a little bit, but if he goes and turns around, like you mentioned, at California Road Trip, hey, that's good. We might be talking a different tune. Here's the problem. He hasn't made the timely save at all over the past two and a half seasons. That's yeah. the one issue that's always been hampering him. That's the bad habit that he has. And if you can't make the timely save, how in the heck are you going to make it through a Stanley Cup run, which is what this team's ultimate goal is? You're not. So Tristan Jari needs to not just perform the way he used to perform. He needs to break out of some bad habits, which is one, being able to make the timely save. First and foremost, he needs to be able to come out and make the save when the team needs it. Because if you look at the opportunities for the Anaheim Ducks, they were few and far between yesterday. But it seemed like every time they got a singular opportunity, 
Tristan Jari let one in. That power play goal, it was one-on-one, man-on-man, and 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 Tristan Jari got beat. Mm-hmm. On the, the breakaway, it was one-on-one, man-on-man, and I get it. It's a breakaway from center ice, and Mason McTavish is a really good young player, but you got beat. You can't get beat every yeah. single time. If it was if it was that happened, but you know, he was great the rest of the game and there were a bunch of tap-ins like it was in St. Louis, it's like, okay, I mean, that's unfortunate. You, you lost that one opportunity you had to change the course of the game, but every single time they scored, Tristan Jari had a chance to change the course of the game and he didn't. And mm-hmm. that's that's a habit that's gonna be worrisome going forward. Yeah, this that that last one, I've never felt the air get sucked out of everything so quickly. Just because of, all right, it's a five on three opportunity. They'll have most of the two minutes for that five on three. Um, it is this vaunted power play that we have heard that we heard so much about coming into the season. It's Eric Carlson, Sidney Crosby, Evgeny Malkin, Jake Gensel when he's healthy. Guess what? He's healthy. Maybe Crystal Tang is out there. He's not, but well, we'll take it. And not only that, but the power play scored a couple times already in the game. And one of them was a five on three already. Okay. So you're in your mind, you're looking at it going, hey, you know what? There's some, really something that could happen here in this late game because you see the clock ticking down, this late game moment. We're going to ignore the fact that it's the Ducks. We're just going to say it's a really hard-fought game, and we're going to find a way to win this. And it, literally in the closing seconds, okay, the first power play is ending. Fine, you have time to record on the second. Maybe you take it into overtime and get your pity point because we're yet to even get one of those. And then three-on-three three overtime with this team because we're yet to see that even. Three and three overtime with Sidney Crosby, uh, probably with Jake Gensel, and maybe with Eric Carlson. Chris Tang out there with Malkin and maybe Riley Smith, maybe Brian Rust. You start to really get the fun, the fun factor into your head. You know, you're thinking of the other side too. Like, all right, well, there's Trevor Zegris. There is how good Mason McTavish is being. Uh Troy Terry. There's all kind of skill on that side of the lineup, too. And then just one quick bad Aaron pass. Uh and your goalie can't make the stop in the literal closing seconds. Because yep. then you look at the clock and you go, there's, what, five seconds left? Well, this stinks. Time to pack it in, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. had to pretty much delete every question I had for the team because, oh, boy, I didn't know what to come up with after that. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's a it's a game and it's a loss that I couldn't help but laugh. It was humorous to me at the end of oh, that the entire like, meteor was laughing so hard. Like, like they couldn't help it. Like you found a way to lose that. No way, shape or form in a tie game with two minutes and eight seconds left. And you're getting a five on three. Should you come away with zero points in the standings in that? And and they found a way to do it. So uh, a lot of that is due to the goaltender, which we've talked about extensively, but you know, they've got a lot of other things that they need to address moving forward as the the calendar flips to November. But we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, let's talk a little bit about that new look power play. You mentioned it very briefly there. Let's dive into it a little bit deeper in the second segment here. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. Penguins, they lost last night 4-3, to three, but a lot of people online were upset about the power play after this game. And yes, the one mistake by Eric Carlson cost the Pittsburgh Penguins the game at the end, making that pass to Evgeny Malkin, a pass that they make seemingly 30 to 40 times on every power play opportunity was red. <laughs> by Adam Henrique of the Anaheim Ducks penalty kill, and he sends Macy McTavish in on the breakaway, who gets the game winner, his second goal of the game, third point of the game, and the Penguins lose their second straight game and their fifth in their last six outings. But a lot of people upset about the power play's performance in general. And coming into this game, I was as well. They were 10% at that point, two for 20, and hadn't scored since October 13th against the Washington Capitals. Last night, they go two for seven, which is good for 28.6%. If you do that throughout an entire season, that's good, Horwat. So I don't understand where the vitriol is for the power play. What did you think last night of their performance? It was definitely better. Uh, it, I can see why people still aren't upset or are, are still upset with it because you have to remember a lot of people are the what have you done for me lately people. And what have, what has the power play done for us lately? Well, they gave up a shorthanded break that cost them the game. 
Uh, I think we've seen Eric Carlson make that you're right, make that specific pass a thousand times. We've seen Eric Carlson just make unreal passes all season so far. You're not gonna, it's, he's not going to hit those passes 100% of the time. That's part of it, too. It's just the way it is. Um, I I can understand how people are still upset with the power play because, well, let's be honest, you have a five-on-three opportunity. Maybe you should have scored while it was five-on-three and not five-on-four with the man in the middle breaking out of the box. Um, maybe smarter decision-making need to be needed to be had in that area. Uh I think Evgeny Malkin took a little blame as well for the power play not scoring at the end there. They just kept finding Dolstall's glove and chest. I don't know how else to put it. I think the power play looked to be a little bit better, a little bit smarter. They were shooting the puck more, uh, which genuinely was has been the killer um, through the early parts of the season. Uh Overall, though, I think if they can keep progressing like this, there won't be too much to worry about. Uh, but they got to find the finishing. And like I kind of slightly mentioned before, this team, Mike Sullivan said, it, and he is right, the team did, the Penguins did look like the better team last night. Yeah. Uh, for a majority of the game, you're rifling off 42 shots for the second game in a row. It's over 40. You do look like the better team look at that deserve to win a meter that we are undefeated with this year um uh, the only time i think that they lost the deserve to win a meter was the four to nothing win over the colorado avalanche <laughs> raise the uh deserve to win banner uh, and he's like mike sullivan isn't totally wrong when you when he says that the penguins looked like the better team and the outcome doesn't reflect that well, then something's got to start reflecting the outcome because they're, it, 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 at this point it's coming down to the finishing ability, right? Well, and like, here's the thing. Deserving to win a game doesn't get you into the postseason, Mike. And I'm tired of hearing that excuse. I mean, it's not an excuse. It's what he's saying. It's what he saw. It's his observation of the game. Fine. But your observation of the game should also be you lost again. Like, you lost again. I don't care if you deserve to win. You didn't win. So something has to change. You it's, can't say, well, I mean, we deserve to win. We outplayed them. So what we're doing is working. It's not working. And last night it was because of your goaltender. But in other games this season, it's been because, and we'll talk about it here, it's been because your team doesn't know how to finish opportunities. And you saw that at some points last night, and, and that goes towards the power play as well. They need to be better at finishing opportunities. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Like, and their finishing ability just hasn't been there. I have a huge save from... Uh, John Gibson at the uh, end of the first period. You know, t maybe the, if that gets tapped in, who knows where the rest of the game goes? Yeah, that one's um, puck luck. But uh, more often than not, that's not the case. That exactly. somebody makes a ridiculous save or that they get that bad of puck luck. Like to say that that's happened over nine games just shows that you're you're blindly hoping and and you're toting a company line. So I've seen a couple people on the internet be like. People always say, well, they need to be better at finishing. These are the chances that they're, they're not finishing. Like, right? Really? Like, really? Like, come on. That's that's the exception and not the rule. Get your head out of your butt. That's that's not the problem. Like, there is a problem here. Stop trying to ignore it. It's just, there's something here. It's just, they're not finishing. There are moments. There have definitely been moments and there have definitely been games where the Penguins looked like the better team. But that finishing ability is not there. And Mike Sullivan is discouraged. He did say that. He is discouraged by this loss, uh, considering the fact that they were the better team. Our change is coming. He kind of hinted at it. We'll see where it goes. I think everyone's kind of rolling their eyes at this point when it comes to the change thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they're, who knows what it's going to be. Who knows what you can change right now. I think for what it's worth, Mike Sullivan is a little less handicapped this time around because he has some more fluid communication with Kyle Dubas where, hey, let's try and change up the mojo a little. Let's do this, 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 and this, and then have actual conversations about it. Um, there's some, There might be something a little different here, and the change has to be – I'm sure we'll talk about it. The, the change has to be something more than just a call-up, and the change also has to be more than just saying – the power play needs to shoot more or we're going to switch out Ricardo Kell for Brian Rust, scratch that Brian Rust for Riley Smith, scratch that. Who's next? Yeah. Eventually you're just shuffling deck chairs on the Titanic. Yeah. Exactly. 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 
to 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 bring this back around to the power play i know we went off on a tangent about the uh, the greater scheme of things there but i mean that's that's what's going to happen after Welcome a lot to like the last state night. of this october like it's... yeah honestly that's that's how this month has gone for the pittsburgh penguins to open up this season but i think that the power play is moving in the right direction and i think if you're trying to to get on them about last night and their performance 28.6% is going to give you a top five power play, which is exactly what you wanted. So you know what? Their performance was fine last night. And more importantly than the two goals that they scored, I look back at the third power play opportunity, and I think that's the best one of the night. No, they didn't score. They built momentum. They got shots on goal. They actually forced Lucas Dostal to make some really in impressive saves. And what did that do for the team? Instead of losing momentum, like we've seen throughout a lot of the season where they get on the power play, they lose the momentum, and it starts to shift in the other team's favor. The Penguins had six, seven, eight shifts in a row after the power play where they just completely hemmed the Ducks into their own zone. They were pushing the pace. They were getting their opportunities. They were getting closer and closer to getting that lead back at one-to-one. -one, and then you take a penalty. And then what happens yeah. there? Okay, you know what? You took a penalty. Let's kill it and get back on the, get back on the attack. Well, the second shot of that power play goes behind Tristan Jari. He gets beat one on one, and now the bubble is completely deflated. And it took getting a five on three at the end of the second period to blow that balloon back up. This team continues to build momentum and leads it up to absolutely nothing, right? You build the momentum to a point, you build all of it to a climax, and then just a disappointing end. All of it. Mm -hmm. it, what this team has done all season long. Yes, you can say that they outplayed their opponent for 50 out of the 60 minutes, but guess what? You still lost. And at the end of the day, I don't really care how badly you outplayed somebody if you still lost. And this is a thing that happens night in and night out. But as far as the power play is concerned, I liked Riley Smith's puck retrieval in the first period on the power play. That directly led to the Eric Carlson goal. I thought that he did a good job getting down low, getting the puck on the rebound and, and starting that cycle again. I like that they had nine shots through the first three power play opportunities. I thought that they looked really good in the first three power play opportunities, obviously scoring on one of them. And then they get the five on three or the dueling five on threes at the end of the second and third periods that again, looked pretty good. All things considered. Now you do have that mistake by Carlson, but that's, that's a mistake. The one thing that bothers me about this power play, and it's not just the power play. It's the penguins at five on five as well. I need to see better screens in front. It's not about scoring in front of the net all the time, especially if they're committed to taking all of these shots from 35 feet away. If Malkin's taking that shot from the point, if Carlson's taking that shot from the point, and another factor in this is the Penguins probably lead the NHL in shots into shin pads this year because they just continue to shoot the puck right into the shin pads of the opponent. But when they do get through, you saw it last night. Lucas Dostal looked like he was playing in warmups. There was nobody in front of him. It was glove save, glove save, glove save. It looked boring for him. You have nobody in front of the net. And you can say, well, Gensel's in front of the net. And then as soon as they shoot the puck, he moves to the side and tries to, to deflect the puck. How many times has he deflected the puck? How many times has he deflected the puck this season? How many times has Sidney Crosby deflected the puck this season? Look at Joe Pavelski and what he does. He stands in front of the net. And he doesn't leave the front of the net. What did Patrick Hornquist do when he was on the Penguins power play? He stood in front of the net and he doesn't leave in front of the net. He stands there and he moves his stick to deflect the puck and he gets out of the way with lifting his leg or by moving a little bit. But you know what he always is? In front of the goaltender. The Penguins, I don't know if they're afraid to get hit by the puck. I don't know if they're coached that way. It's something I'd like to ask Todd Reardon. Stand in front of the net because if you don't, goaltenders in this league except Tristan Jari, will make that save every time. Oh, damn. <laughs> this, well, we're at the state of this team, man. Um, hey, you get into the little things. It's the little things that aren't working for them. And it's, that's the difference between finishing and not finishing this league. It's, it's yeah. microscopic, but it's something like that where you're taking all these shots from the point. And you can say, hey, puck retrieval, you set it up. I've got Malkin one-timer, Eric Carlson one-timer. Crosby comes up and gets a shot from the point. If you're committed to making those shots, then your net front presence has to actually be a net front presence and not just stand to the left of Dostal and put your stick on his left pad as he as he makes the glove save. Yeah, it's 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 finding the finishing ability. It, 
don't know how else to put it. They're getting their opportunities and they're capitalizing on a couple here and there. We saw the Evgeny Malkin five on three. Think about five on threes. I always feel it's different from a regular power play just because you have that much mm-hmm. more ice. You have that much mm-hmm. more of a chance. It kind of counts. It, yeah, it's a, it is a full goal. It is a full tack onto your power play percentage, but it always feels like it was just a half. Like you, you should have done that. That's what makes the missed five on three at the end even worse. Cause it's double all of a sudden. Um, but that you know, that goal from Eric Carlson in, in the first period, huge. Just to get, just to have him wake up a little bit, to have the power plays gain some momentum and gain some mojo. If again, like I mentioned with the with Tristan Jari over this upcoming breaking into the trip, if we come back from the trip and we go, he was a perfect, he was a perfect this this for this this doing this this and this, we kind of forget all about it. If the power play can all of a sudden take their momentum that they gained from scoring that first one and then that second one on the five on three but they felt the mojo kind of start to kick a little bit the momentum start to ride in their favor if they can start rolling that into some more some more goals and that can roll into some more wins you know we we remember this happened but we kind of forget that it uh really held them back the power play we've already seen can be a game-changing situation Mm -hmm. the penguins already had a handful of games where the it's impossible to get consistent five on five play because uh, the refs are being whistle happy, and sometimes that's perfectly fine. It's the early, it's still the early parts of the season where they are making a ton of calls, where they are not, where they're calling it really tight. Um, the Penguins have to take advantage of that. That's a big issue here: is that they're not fully embracing and taking advantage of those opportunities. Um, did things seem to be pushed in the right direction against Anaheim? Absolutely, yep. they scored twice. That's a big positive. If it had the Let's say they just kind of lost on a last second goal. It, it, it wasn't a five on three situation. It wasn't a power play situation. They just kind of lost on a on a freak last second. We're not having the power play discussion. We're saying it looked a no. lot better. They scored mm-hmm. twice. They scored on a huge five on three. They were gaining momentum. Maybe Riley Smith is the answer or the key or whatever you want to discuss with the power play. But we're not having this discussion of, well, you fumbled the bag because of what have you done for me lately? Oh, yeah, one bad pass because you were overpassing a little bit more uh, again. Mike Sullivan was not happy with the power play uh, during a practice at PBG Paints Arena last week. Mm-hmm. You could verbally hear him yelling at them. Uh, I believe an expletive was used and something about passing the puck into the net. Now, mm-hmm. like we said, the power play did shoot a little more this time around. They did score twice. But that, that pass-happy feeling got to them on that last one. Mm-hmm. Again, not that they weren't taking shots on that opportunity. They were. Yeah. But it was just that one. And I can see why people are upset with the power play because that one. But it looks better. I think overall it looks better, but it's now a matter of finishing. Yeah. Here's one last thing I want to mention on the power play. They got lulled into a sense of security on that five on three. You could tell. Yes. Because one, I don't know what it was the one time Carlson and Malkin passed the puck back and forth to each other like eight times in a row. I don't know why. I don't know what that was supposed to do, uh, but that was just interesting. I don't think that that did any good or it got them any closer to scoring a goal. But the other thing was you see these players that are ultra talented and they think, hey, we can make these plays you know, in our sleep. And there are times where, listen, the rotation that they have up top is really good and it makes them hard to defend. And that five on three, when you're saying, okay, it's five on three, they're going to say and and play conservative. They're going to stay back, try to make sure there's no open lanes down low. Adam Henrique is a veteran in this league. Adam Henrique is a smart player in this league. He's not the most talented, but he's played so many games. Why? Because he thinks the game at a higher level. The Penguins scored both of their goals from the exact same spot that that puck was intercepted at. You think Adam Henrique didn't know, hey, this is where they're going to try to score the goal. This is what they're trying to do. They're trying to set up Evgeny Malkin there. So the second that puck gets on Eric Carlson's stick, Adam Henrique knows, okay, with one second left on the power play or the five on three, I know Mason's coming out of the box and I know that there's a more than 50% chance Carlson tries to make this pass to Evgeny Malkin. He takes a couple steps forward. He picks off the pass because it's exactly what Eric Carlson does and he springs Mason McTavish. That's just getting lulled into a sense of security if you're the Penguins and you can't do that when you are playing teams that have wily veteran penalty killers like Adam Henrique who saw, listen, Carlson's goal, Malkin's goal came from that exact same play. So yeah, the Penguins are trying to go back to the well for a third time to win the game. Henrique knew what was coming. He read the play, he made the play, and the Ducks 
get to walk away with their fourth straight victory and two points at PPG Paints Arena. So overall, power play is fine. I don't know why people are, are mad about the power play. That's a bad mistake. There's a couple things they still need to fix. Getting Absolutely. better net front presences and not getting lulled into a sense of security there and a five on three. But at the end of the day, it's it's not on the power play that they lost that game. It's on the guy we talked about for 20 minutes in the first segment. I don't have to go back to it. I talked about it for 22 minutes. My post game show was 22 minutes, and that was all bashing on Tristan Jari. So I, I don't I, I don't need to. I, we don't need to keep going with that. But at the end of the day, I, I think the power play is heading in the right direction, trending in the right direction. So and last night was was certainly a case of that. Well, you were bashing Tristan Jari in the in your post game. I was googling Macklin Celebrini to just kind of get a feel for how he's going to be. <laughs> for those for those that don't know the name, uh that is uh reportedly going to be the next number 1 overall pick at the uh, NHL draft. So, that's the that's the mindset that you're in that we're in that we are all kind of feeling out the process of so what would a number one overall pick look like in Pittsburgh again I mean it's not out of the question the Pittsburgh Penguins at the end of October which is the first pseudo full month of the season dead last in the Eastern Conference so we'll talk about that we'll talk about them reaching a break in the season and we'll finish this show off after this quick break Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. The Penguins, they've reached a a little break in the season because they now have a four-day rest before their next game on Saturday night, which kicks off their California road trip. They leave October with a 3-6-0 record. Like I mentioned before the break, that is dead last in the Eastern Conference. And according to Wes Crosby of NHL.com, It is the lowest point total, six standings points, the lowest point total through nine games since the 2005-2006 season when Sidney Patrick Crosby was a rookie. Leo Carlson, who played in last night's game, was nine months old. That's the last time the Penguins have gotten off to this slow of a start, and they were 0-4-5 to start that season, 3-6-0 to start this one. So if there's anything to take away from it, it's at least they have the wins and they're not just getting all pity points. And actually, the funny part is about the start of that season is uh, it didn't they that that's just the first nine games that trend continued until game ooh ten oh, yeah. game ten when they finally won seven to five over the Atlanta Thrashers. This is ugly. Ugh. Mm-hmm. this is yeah. this is the situation we're in, man. And the funny thing is, like, none of those were wins. All those points from before. Yeah, um, at least they, they got all... three wins in this one, and. You know, one of them was a very impressive win over the Colorado yeah. Avalanche, which which kind of clouds everybody's judgment of saying this team could be the worst team in the National Hockey League. Everybody says, well, I mean, you have the talent and you just went out and beat the Avalanche four days ago soundly. So the question then becomes, do you still believe that this is a playoff caliber team that you're watching on the ice? Uh, as I was scrolling Twitter in between the... Uh in between during that little break there um i I did see a a couple of things that one of them was that this team can still do it there are certain things that do need to be tweaked and changed Mm -hmm. um and who knows if they're coming who knows what it might take but certain things about this team are are pretty solid we just discussed the power play we discussed how people aren't happy with it but it is getting there it is genuinely getting there they're taking their chances they're shooting the puck Eric Carlson said last week at some point that they just need to, someone needs to take charge. Someone needs to just you know, be the quarterback almost. Um, it seems like they're kind of getting there. Uh, listen, so you never bet against Sidney Crosby. Uh, that first line is doing pretty good. Like I mentioned, 12 mm-hmm. shots on goal, a career high. Um, Jake Gensel's a little snake bitten. Yikes. But his numbers otherwise look pretty good. I mean, he was yeah. He gets uh, six points through three games. It was five assists, but hey, you have six points. It's well, if you're finding a new a new level to your game, and the other one starts waking up a little, that's going to make you a really dangerous player. 
Yeah. The other thing with Gensel too is I don't think they're putting in position in position to score goals, especially on the power play. I don't think they're putting. And part of that is you know he's supposed to be the net front guy. Maybe he should stay in the net front a little bit more. But I don't think he's in position to really utilize his shot enough in most instances for the Pittsburgh Penguins. So I I, I don't it that's my gut feeling. If I go back and watch it, I might say the different thing. But I think especially on the power play, they're not putting him in positions to be the finisher for that team. And part of me is a little confused as to why, because he's been their leading scorer, I think, three of the past five years. So I don't know. I, I think that that's part of it, but not ob- obviously all of it, because in the past, he's been able to get his in the same situation or similar situations. Yeah. And I mean, he's got 32 shots on goal so far this year. I mean, having that amount through nine games is a pretty big number. City Crosby is 39 through uh, nine games, in case you were curious. Um, it, it doesn't fall. I feel like it, this is another situation where the, the downfalls are not falling on the the main guys. Sidney Crosby's leading the team points already. Or sorry, second in the team points. He's got 10 points through nine games. Evgeny Malkin had that monstrous first week uh, mm-hmm. and has still looked pretty consistent since then. Uh, like we said, Jake Gensel has nine points. Yeah, only two of them are goals, but nine points. And he is rifling the puck with those 32 shots. Brian Rust is waking up. We needed that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Riley Smith is that great chemistry with Evgeny Malkin already. We're still waiting on Ricard Raquel to you know, not hit the snooze button. Maybe if you put uh, him on the first line, but I digress. Hey, you're struggling. Here's a promotion. I uh, We'll see. Um and the third line's starting to wake up a little bit. The defense hasn't been totally god awful. I mean, stop putting Latang and, like you said, stop putting Latang Carlson out there at the same time because that is a defensive nightmare. You'll get some goals, maybe, but you, you better hope it doesn't leave the zone. Um, and if Eric Carlson can also start waking up, you know, more, uh, he's been, he's played pretty well. His the defensive part of his game, every game, I'm like, he is a genuinely good defenseman. Hmm. There are times where it's obvious that he's not, but again, there are a lot of moments where it's the way he can a turn defense into offense and b actually make some good stick plays. He's solid enough, especially if he's playing with Marcus Pedersen, who's a great defenseman. That's that's what I, that I was about to say. It, it helps that he's playing with the best Penguins defenseman. It, yeah. it helps that he's playing with Marcus Pedersen because if he wasn't playing with Marcus Pedersen, I think it'd be a little bit more obvious that eric carlson does struggle in his own zone but I, i'll de- i will yeah. defer to the fact that he's looked better than i expected i i also think losing john ludwig might be a little bit more of a that might be bigger than we think because he was playing really well he was playing a little bit like mark friedman before his injury occurred so now we're stuck with chad ruedel again who don't get me wrong is chad ruedel but he's not really chad ruedel anymore uh, his underlying numbers are really good. It's just sometimes he makes that mistake. You know, if you if you don't notice him, he's doing all the right things. But the one time, the couple times you do notice him, he's always doing the wrong thing, which gives a very negative perception on a player that overall is not as negative as people think he is. Right. And for what it's worth, Ryan Shea has been unnoticeable. Good. Yes. Yeah. Ryan Shea is just completely flown under the radar, which for what he's supposed to do, he's doing his job well. But yeah. You know, we again, we're we're all over the place after this one, but we have four days to kind of dissect everything. The last thing I want to ask you here before we go, because we do have a meeting. Uh, the last thing I want to ask you here before we go, how long do you think Kyle Dubas waits before making a major change? A lot of people have asked me this on, on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it. A lot of people asked me this in the comment section last night on the post game show. How long do you think Kyle Dubas will wait? And it, if you think he makes one, what do you think that change ends up being? I bet he doesn't wait long. I don't know what kind of change it would be, though, um, because you have to. I, I mean, listen, one move isn't going to change the team. It isn't going to immediately improve it and make it an all star team. Uh, it's it, really hard to pick what it could be. We're stuck with Jeff Carter. There's nothing you could do about that. Because notice, I just ran down all the good things of the team. What did I not notice? The fo- or what did I not pick out? The fourth line and the goaltending. Um, and go- the goaltending we can get to in a minute. But the fourth line, if you change your fourth line, that, that, that's, that, and that's what gets you going, you have bigger issues. You have bigger yeah. issues if, if the fourth line changing is what gets you. Jeff Carter's not going anywhere, though, so forget that. Oh, Chari's his boy. That's Cal Dubas' boy. Signed up for three years with a modified no-trade. 
I don't think he's going to get taken out anytime soon. And Matt Nieto, maybe something can happen there, but that's also a two-year deal. Um, I always feel like the guys that you just signed, you just brought on, are going to get a bit of a longer leash because they're new. I, so it sounds like the entire fourth line is sticking around for a little bit more. Don't know what else to say about that, at least in my mm-hmm. head. Maybe uh, you've really got to have a talk with Jeff Carter, man. But I think well, that's a big one. But also, for what it's worth, it, he didn't have a bad game. There was a couple moments where I was like, hey, he, he looks fast at one point. The, new, the big new scoreboard at PBG Paints Arena will sometimes show speeds and how fast mm-hmm. everyone is skating. There was a point I looked up and went, huh, Jeff Carter has the fastest skating speed of the night so far. And and I saw it and I went, you know what? Yes, he does. Uh, so there's there's still some sort of thing there to keep Jeff Carter in the lineup. Other than that, the, I, mean, I mean, I mentioned the top three lines are solid. They're fine. They're doing good. The fourth line mm-hmm. isn't, but you're not going to change any of that. The defense looks good. Well- the power play is waking up, and here we are back at the Tristan Jari conundrum. Yeah, Tristan Jari is obviously the biggest change that would need to be made. But again, similar to, to, to Jeff Carter, it's going to be hard for them, if not impossible, for them to make an actual move in that area. But with Jeff Carter, here's the thing. Look what happened when you took Jansen Harkins off the third line and put in Redeem Zahorna. Now, you have to introduce the right piece, but exchanging yep. one piece could change the entire outlook of an entire line. Jeff Carter can't be sent down. Jeff Carter can't be traded unless he not requests a trade, but allows a trade to happen. Doesn't mean you can't put him in the press box, at least for a game. See what happens right. when you put Vinny Henestrosa there because Vinny Henestrosa is on the NHL roster right now. Salary yeah. cap compliant and everything with $16,000 to spare. Vinny Henestrosa is on the roster. Now, I understand it's Mike Sullivan's boy, but Mike Sullivan has to realize that his seat warmer just got turned on a little bit. Now, here's the thing. I don't think that Kyle Dubas is going to make any changes leading up to this road trip. There were some rumors that he would. Those rumors were all very not based. In fact, there's not going to be any changes leading up to this road trip in the four-day break. If the Penguins go even one and two on this road trip, that puts them at four and eight on the season, whether they get a pity point or not. Four wins, eight losses on the Western California road trip is not an easy one. One and two is a realistic response, whether you're playing well or not. Right, the LA Kings are great. The Ducks just beat the Pittsburgh Penguins. The Sharks stink. You should get a win over the Sharks. But and I was gonna say, you bet. If that is one of your losses, then you really do need to look at the rest of the league standings and go, "Oh goodness gracious!" Exactly. Be- so. But if they come, if they come home four and eight, I think Kyle Dubas is probably already making phone calls and trying to figure out how he can fix this team. If they come mm-hmm. home four and eight, that expedites the process a whole lot. They need to have a winning road trip to save a lot of people's butts down on the ice there at PPG Paints Arena. Now, here's the thing of what the move would be. Mm-hmm. I still find it very hard to believe that Mike Sullivan's going anywhere, at least oh, in, in the near future. Yeah, But his support staff is on the chopping block. You know, goaltending coach, we've seen that change midseason. Assistant coaches, we've seen that change. Both assistant coaches, honestly, could be on it because they're in their final year of their contract and they're not going to care. They're going to be like, all right, you're gone. But here's the thing. It's not just getting rid of them to, to wake Mike Sullivan up and say, hey, you have a new support staff. It's it's people that are directly hired by Kyle Dubas. But here's the other thing. I could see Kyle Dubas bringing in somebody that eventually could supplant Mike Sullivan, somebody with the pedigree that could eventually supplant Mike Sullivan to really heat things up for Sullivan, to really open his eyes to, hey, you need to change something. You need to get better. Not that I don't think that there's a healthy relationship there between Dubas and Sullivan, certainly healthier than it was between Hextall and Sullivan, but something to just kind of give him a jolt. Because right now, I don't believe they have that guy in the organization. Right, The one person that you could really argue is Todd Reardon. You might even have an argument for Mike Vellucci, but you're going to see a lot of the same things. I don't think that that's the correct form of action. So if you're going to make a change, a major change, not just making a call up, I could see it being, hey, your assistant coaches are gone. We're bringing in this guy. And I think it's going to be known, not spoken, but known that this guy is somebody that the second Mike Sullivan slips a little too far below the surface, he's going to get supplanted by this guy. Because I don't I don't seem to believe that that's J.D. Forrest. He doesn't really have that Dan Bilesma, Mike Sullivan circa 2016 feel to him. So I could see Kyle Dubas saying, hey, uh, we're bringing this guy in. 
And then it can go rather unspoken that if you don't perform well and your team doesn't perform well, this guy's going to be the next head coach of the Pittsburgh Penguins. You're right. And I totally see that. The One of the issues is, is at this point, the season started, who's out there? Who's available? That's that's a major question. The, uh, the biggest coach c- coaching name on the market is somebody that uh, Kyle Dupas actually fired in the past. So I don't not, see uh I don't see Mike Babcock coming to Pittsburgh anytime soon. Certainly not as an assistant. Uh, not and, in the not in the situation that I outlined. No. Can, and considering how things ended before they started in Columbus, I don't see him getting a job ever again in the NHL. So there's that. Um, yeah. I, I was also chatting with. Uh, Brian Metzer after the game. I ran into him on the way out of the arena. Friend of the show, Brian Metzer, I should say. Mm-hmm. Uh, we both believe, we, and we both know, Mike Sullivan's not going anywhere. Wait, where he's not. That new contract, I will, I will continue to pound the table on this. I will not actually pound the table because that's where my microphone is sitting. Thank you. But I will continue to pound the table and say his contract is not started yet. Wait until next year with this. Is this he getting warm? Sure. But it's... But once that contract starts, then you can really start having the discussion of, okay, things aren't changing. Maybe he's a little comfortable in his spot. Sometimes a warm seat is comfy. And you know what I mean? I don't know if that really helps anything, but sometimes that warm seat is comfortable to sit in. He has a comfortable spot and a very cushy position in this organization. He got that, he got that contract signed two years in advance. And apparently it was just FSG's idea. I, well, I mean, sure, Kyle do Kyle Dubas probably does also really like Mike Sullivan as a head coach. Maybe it helps that Sullivan was quote unquote part of the hiring process. Don't know exactly to what extent. But again, you when you're if if you're Mike Sullivan, you and you and let's we don't know exactly to what extent he was in that hiring process. But if he was at all involved, well, Kyle Dubas. Man, he hired me. I know he's below me, but he hired me. Or Mike Sullivan, I'm hiring the guy that might fire me? No, I'm going to hire the guy that's going to keep me around. Mike Sullivan might be in a bit of a comfortable position. And I like your idea of making him uncomfortable somehow. Forcing that change. Make that with the lineup as well. Make someone uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Don't know how you do that. P.O. Joseph's still sitting around doing nothing. Could he be on the chopping block? I don't think Dropped. that moves the needle enough. No, it doesn't because considering he's a healthy scratch, but yeah, I, where, where do we go from here? And we're starting yeah. to get to that point of the point of the season. And it's, that's still October for a couple more hours. Yeah. Where do we go from here? I don't know. Something tells me that the, uh, my steadfast belief that Mike Sullivan's not going anywhere because of his contract is starting to whittle away because at the end of the day, FSG made that hire early on in their ownership of the Pittsburgh Penguins, and they admitted several times early on in their ownership of the Pittsburgh Penguins that they're not too invested in under, understanding NHL and the way the NHL business works. They they rely on other people to do so. So they might like Mike Sullivan as the person, but quickly they're going to understand that Mike Sullivan, the coach, if he's not producing, is going to cost them money. And at the end of the day, that is a money-making organization. The entire league is, but certainly FSG is. So I'm not saying that he's on the chopping block. I'm not saying that he's on the hot seat, but I'm saying that the fact that, hey, you know, his contract hasn't started. I don't think that's uh, I don't think that's as big of a factor going forward as I used to. But we'll see how attendance has been down to attendance has slipped every game since the opener as well. So when you go back to the money thing in a gate driven league, we get that FSG makes a ton of money. We get that the Penguins make a ton of money, allegedly. Um, the, the attendance is down. The yeah. visuals of empty seats is on the rise. So yeah. something will give there, surely, uh, hopefully. For what it's yeah. worth, the, the new scoreboard is a treat to see. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the, the new lights don't make that much of a difference, I guess, whatever. Um, and for what it's worth, home games are still fun to go to. They are still fun atmospheres. But the product on the ice, the reason why you paid that much money, because ticket prices are also going up, um, is not good. So something's got to give there. Someone's got to wake up and make the moves. Like I said, Mike Sullivan hinted at moves. We'll see if something happens. Practice is at 12 today, and then a day off, and then to California. 
Yeah, we'll see what ends up happening with that. I think this is an actually pivotal road trip for the Pittsburgh Penguins when it comes to the direction of their season and what they end up doing when it comes to the personnel on the ice. I think Kyle Dubas is taking this one uh, a little bit more seriously than he's, he took that home game four or four game homestand, especially considering you lose three of those four games. And at the end of it, it's it's worrisome because the team on the ice, for the most part, looks good but they can't get wins. And at the end of the day, it is a wins driven business and is in a gate driven league. So uh, we are going to be back later in this week, but thank you guys so much for tuning in. We will see you guys next time.